classical ethics, like its modern counterpart, proceeds from the question, what ought I to do? This ought retains an, unspec an unspecific meaning until the problem in question is determined more closely, and with it then the vantage point whence it is supposed to be solved. Taking pragmatic, ethical, and moral questions as my guide, I wish first of all to differentiate the use of practical reason. Practical reason is expected to fulfill different functions with respect to what it is expedient, good, or just. Accordingly, the constellation of reason and will changes in pragmatic, ethical, and moral discourse, and so I think also the meaning of ought in pragmatic instructions, in ethical advice, and in moral judgments. The second part of my lecture tonight is an attempt to roughly characterize the corresponding types of discourse and to distinguish those different concepts of practical reason that traditionally appear under the title purposive rationality, phonesis or judgment, or uh, morality. You will have uh, realized by now that I take quite a conventional route of moral philosophy and start from the internal point of view of a participant who is in need of orientation. Only at the very end I will hint at the type of research for which I would use the results of uh, tonight's preliminary considerations. I mean, how how is it uh, phonetically and acoustically? I mean, you, you understand me? I mean, uh, maybe not in content, but... Uh, <laughs> okay. It might be difficult behind me. Anyhow. To begin with, there are different types of questions, pragmatic, ethical, and moral questions. Let me first uh, illustrate that. We are, confronted, we are confronted by practical problems in different situations. We search for reasons for a decision that mean different options. If, for example, the bicycle we always use is broken, if our health starts to suffer, or if we uh, don't have the cash to satisfy certain needs. Now, in the next step, the goals can themselves become problematical, for instance, if the plan for a forthcoming holiday suddenly falls through, or if a person has to make up his mind as to which career he or she should strive for, at least if you are not just looking for jobs. Whether one travels to Scandinavia or stays at home, this is a very German perspective, whether one would prefer to become a doctor or a manager depends in the first instance on our preferences and on the options, of course, open to us in such a situation. Again, we hunt for reasons, this time for a decision among the girls themselves. In both cases, what I ought to do is in part determined by what one wants. In other words, we are concerned with a rational choice of means, given preset purposes, or with a rational weighing up of purposes, given existing preferences. Our will is in fact already framed by needs and values. It is only open for alternative choices of means or purposes. These compromise the techniques appropriate in each case, be it a bicycle repair or treatment of a disease, strategies for procuring money, programs for holiday planning, or choice of career. 
I mean, everybody of you who ever has uh, sit in a philosophical class already knows that philosophers' examples are, uh, I mean, uh, surprisingly familiar. <laughs> uh, now, such practical reasoning leads to recommendations which in simple cases takes the semantic form of conditional imperatives. Kant speaks here of uh, rules of skill, the Schicklichkeitsregeln, and judicious advice, in other words, of technical and pragmatic imperatives. Their illusionary point can be understood as a relative ought, the instruction state, what one ought to do or must do, on the condition that one wishes to implement certain values or pursue certain purposes. Once the values themselves, however, become problematic, the question as to what ought I to do points beyond this horizon of purposive rationality. With complex decisions, such as, for example, the choice of a career pattern or an academic field, it may become clear that this is not a pragmatic question at all. Certainly, whoever wants to go into publishing management has to consider, at least in Germany, whether it would be more expedient to first run through an apprenticeship or to go straight to university. But whoever does not really know what she really wants is faced with a completely different situation. In the latter case, the choice of career or the corresponding uh, academic field is linked to the question of inclinations or interests, to the question of what sort of subject matter and activity one would satisfying, and so on and so on, uh, I am not telling you. The more radically this question is pressed, the more it comes to a head as the issue of what life one wishes to lead. And this in turn amounts to the question as to which person one is and who one wishes to be. Whoever in the context of vital resolutions of this kind does not know what she wants will in the end ask who she is and whom she wants to be. Trivial or weak decisions of preference do not, of course, require any justification. No one must justify the make or type of a car or the sort of pullover he prefers. Strong preferences, to adopt the term used by Chuck Taylor, are by contrast those evaluations that are not the product of some ephemeral mood or inclination, but rather involve his or her self-understanding. That means the manner of life she leads and the character. These are all bound up with a person's specific identity. It is this that lends existential resolutions not only their weight, but also a context within which they both require justification and, to a certain extent, are capable of it. Ever since Aristotle, serious value decisions have been treated as clinical questions of the good life or a life that is not failed. I mean, under modern conditions, we better speak not so emphatically of the good life, but rather in the negative uh, of a life that is not misspent. As Nono said, das nicht verfehlte Leben. An illusionary decision such as binding oneself to the wrong partner, choosing and staying with the wrong career, can result in a misspent life. Practical reason which in this sense is oriented not only towards what is possible and expedient, but also towards what is good, moves into the domain of ethics, to use the classical terminology. 
Now, strong evaluations are embedded in contexts of self-understanding. How I conceive of myself depends not just on how describe I my, myself, but also on the examples I try to model myself on. My identity is determined at once both by how I see myself and how I wish to be seen, on what I find myself to be and which ideals I project myself in my life towards. This existential self-understanding is evaluative in nature and somehow uh, genus faced It contains two strands, namely both the descriptive element of the ego's past life history and the normative element of the, let's say, ego ideal. As a consequence, clarification of self-understanding or clinical ascertainment of one's own identity require an appropriative form of understanding, namely the appropriation of one's own life history as well as of traditions and contexts of life that have determined one's socialization. This hermeneutic procedure of self-understanding can be pushed to a level of self-reflection if, in a clinical sense, illusions are involved. Critical awareness of one's life history and its formative context is not a value-neutral self-understanding, rather the hermeneutically gained description of self is linked, internally linked, with a critical relation to oneself. That is, a more profound self-understanding will alter attitudes rooted, at least, in an overall life project. There will be better reasons at hand to decide, for example, on studying either applied economics or theology if one has clarified who one is and wishes to be. The answer to ethical questions are generally unconditional imperatives of the following type. You must embark on a career that gives you the feeling that you are helping other people. The sense in which this sentence isn't imperative can be understood as an art that does not depend on contingent purposes and preferences, and yet is not absolute. Here, what you ought or must do means that, on the whole, and in the long run, it is good for you if you act accordingly. Strong evaluations depend on the goal set me as an absolute, but set me as an absolute, namely on my good and happy or not misspent life. The question what I ought to do undergoes now a further change in meaning as soon as my actions violate the interests of others and lead to conflicts that need to be regulated impartially than is from the moral point of view. A few comparisons will help us to clarify the new quality that thus comes into play. Pragmatic tasks, I mean, of the sort I mentioned at first. Pragmatic tasks are posed from the perspective of an actor who proceeds from his own purposes and preferences. In strategic action, the, when at least two parties are involved, uh, the participants assume that each person decides egocentrically in line with his or her respective interests. Here, a latent conflict, so to say permanently, exists between the various opponents from the outset. This conflict can either take its course or be curbed and brought under control, even on the basis of a balance of interests. However, without a radical change in perspective and attitude, the participants cannot perceive an interpersonal conflict to be a moral problem. If I can only procure the money, for instance, I need, 
by withholding some of the relevant facts, then seen pragmatically, all that counts is the potential success of the maneuver. Maneuver. Whoever casts doubts on the admissibility, however, of such an approach is putting a different type of question, namely the moral question, whether everyone would want all persons in my situation to act according to the same maxim. Even ethical issues do not yet require a complete break with an egocentric perspective. They refer, after all, to the feelers of one's own life. Seen from this perspective, other persons, other life histories, and interest positions only gain importance to the extent that, in the framework of our intersubjectively shared form of life, they are kindred to and intertwined with my identity, with my life history, and the state of my interests. My socialization process is determined by traditions that I share with other persons, of course. My personal identity is shaped by collective identities, and my life history is, of course, embedded in an overarching historical context. To this degree, the life which is good for me also touches on life forms that are common to us. Accordingly, for Aristotle, the ethos of the individual only mirrors the ethos of the polis. However, the direction of ethical question is different from that of moral questions. The relation of interpersonal conflicts that arise from opposing interests is not yet an issue. Let me return to our example. Whether I wish to be someone who, in actual need, is prepared to engage in, let's say, petty fraudulence vis-à-vis an anonymous insurance company, is at first not a moral question. For the question has to do with my self-esteem and possibly with the respect of others show me. But it does not focus on the issue of the equal respect for everybody. Yet, the moment we start testing our maxims in terms of their being reconcilable with those of others, we are getting closer to the moral standpoint. Maxims are what can terms those situational, more or less trivial, everyday rules of thumb towards which individuals customarily orient their action. They relieve uh, these maxims, the actor of the burden of making decisions all the time, and they cluster more or less consistently to form a practice which reflects one's character and the manner in which one conducts one's life. In general, maxims form the smallest units in a network of habits in which a person or a group or group's identity and lifestyle take on a concrete shape. They regulate the daily rounds, the manner one adopts when deciding, when dealing with other people, handling problems, solving conflicts, and so on and so on. Now, these maxims are situated in the interface between ethics and morality because they can be judged according to both ethical and moral viewpoints. The maxim that I will allow myself to engage in petty fraud may not be good for me, namely if it is not compatible with the picture of the person who I wish to be and as whom I want to be recognized. The same maxim, however, may also be, and of course is, unjust. Namely, if general adherence to it is not equally good for all and everybody. If informed by the question of how I wish to live, then testing maxims lay claim to the practical reason in a different way 
Men does the moral testing of whether a maxim is suited to regulate our lives if it constitutes a general practice. In the one instance, the maxim is tested in terms of whether it is good for me and appropriate to the situation. In the other, I am testing whether I can want a maxim to be a general law obeyed by all. The former is an ethical consideration, the latter one of a moral nature, albeit still moral in a somewhat restricted sense. For the result of this reasoning continues to remain somehow tied to the first person perspective. Even in moral reasoning, even in moral reasoning, my own perspective is determined, is determined by my understanding of myself. And a lax attitude towards petty fraudulence may also be compatible with the way in which I wish to live, even if others behave similarly in a comparable situation and occasionally then make me the victim of their feelings and feelings. It does not follow from an egocentric test of a maxim's universal liability that that maxim would also be accepted by all the others as a moral guideline for their actions. This conclusion would only be correct if my perspective would converge a fortiori with those of all the others. Only if my identity and my life project would reflect uni a universally valid form of life, as Aristotle still thought, would that, which from my perspective is equally good for all, indeed be in the equal interest of everyone, but you know, under modern conditions we are far from that. It is only Kant's categorical imperative that breaks with the egocentricity of the golden rule. According to the categorical imperative, a maxim is just, as you well know, if everyone could want it to be adhered to by all in comparable situations. Not only me, but each person must be able to want the maxim to become a universal law. Only, I mean, think of human rights, for instance. Only a maxim that can be generalized from the perspective of all possibly affected by it deserves general agreement and in that mercy of recognition that is morally binding. The question of what I ought to do is now answered with strict reference to that which one, which one ought to do. Moral precepts are categorical or unconditional imperatives that express valid norms or derive from them. The evolutionary point of such imperatives can be understood as an ought that is dependent neither on contingent purposes or preferences, nor on the telos of a good, or at least not totally misspent life, that I set for myself as an absolute goal. Rather, what one ought to do, must, or what one must do, means that it is just and thus the content of one's duty. To sum up, uh, the question of uh, what I ought to do can receive either a pragmatic, an ethical, or a moral meaning. We are concerned in all three cases with the justification of a choice between possibilities of uh, alternative courses of action. Yet pragmatic tasks demand a, a different type of action, and the corresponding question requires a different type of answer than do ethical and moral tasks. A preferential appraisal of purposes and uh, purpose of rational assessments of, the, of available means both serve a decision on how one should intervene in the objective world in order to bring about a desired state of affair. This type of reasoning involves clarification, of course, of empirical questions and questions of rational choice. Recommendations on a suitable technique or an implementable program forms the terminus ad quem of the corresponding pragmatic discourse. 
Now, rational preparation of a serious value decision, which touches on the direction one takes in leading one's life, is something different. Here, we have to do with the hermeneutic clarification of an individual self-understanding and the clinical question of one's good or not misspent life. The advice as to the correct orientation of one's life forms the terminus ad quem of the corresponding ethical discourse. Finally, moral judgment of actions and maxims is yet again something unlike the two other. Moral reasoning serves to clarify what are legitimate behavioral expectations in the face of interpersonal conflicts. Here we are con concerned with the justifications and the application of norms that encode reciprocal duties and rights. Moral judgments in view of a conflict in the domain of non-regulated actions forms the terminus ad quem of the corresponding moral practical discourse. The pragmatic, the ethical, the moral use of practical reason is thus designed for technical and strategic instruction, clinical advice, and moral judgment, respectively. Practical reason is a name we give to the competence to provide justifications for corresponding imperatives. Depending on the time of action at stake and the decision to be made, not only the illocutionary meaning of the master or all changes within a certain category, so does the concept of the will that is to be determined by imperatives in each case. The notion of the will that is addressed changes in each case. The art of pragmatic instructions is relative to contingent, to contingent purposes and preferences and is addressed to the free will of a subject who makes intelligent decisions on the basis of given needs and values. The capacity for rational choice does not extend to the uh, underlying interests and value orientations themselves, but are framed by them. The art of clinical advice, on the other hand, is relative to the telos of a good life and is addressed to the free will of an individual who has decided already on leading, let me say, an authentic life and strives for what one might call self-realization. The capacity for existential decision and radical self-choice uh, an expression of Kierkegaard, of course, always speaks within the horizon of a life history from the traces of which the individual can learn who she is and wants to be. And, finally, the categorical order of moral norms is addressed is to the free will of an autonomous person who acts according to uh, self-legislated uh, laws. It is only in this will, in its third meaning, that is free in the emphatic sense that it can be determined throughout in terms of moral judgments, that is, of reasons. In the domain in which moral law obtains, neither accidental dispositions nor life history or personal identity places a limit on the penetration, so to say, of will by practical reason. Only such a will, which is completely determinable by moral insights, can be called autonomous, at least in the Kantian sense. All heteronomous traits have been erased from it, whether due to subjective preferences or individual life projects. Kant, however, confused the autonomous will with an omnipotent will. In order to put this will in a sovereign position, Kant had to transpose it into the intelligible world. Yet in the world as we know it, the autonomous will 
as efficacious only to the extent that the motivational force of good reasons is able to prevail over competing motives. In sum, practical reason is directed towards the will of a purposive, rationally acting subject when applied from the viewpoint of what is expedient. It is addressed to the will of a subject, secondly, of authentic self-realization when applied from the viewpoint of what is good for him or her. And finally, it is addressed towards the will of a subject capable of moral judgment when applied from the viewpoint of justice. The constellation, so to say, of reason and will changes in each case. In line with changes in the meaning of the question, what ought I to do, not only does a change occur in the analysis, the will of the actor who is hunting for an answer, but so too in the informant, the concept of practical reason itself changes in these instances. For Kant, practical reason coincides with morality. Reason and will are only unified in a person's autonomy. For empiricism, deeply ingrained in Anglo-Saxon traditions, for empiricism, practical reason is absorbed in its pragmatic application. It is somehow reduced to purpose of rationality for instance, in utilitarianism. For the Aristotelian tradition, practical reason takes on the role of a phronesis or judgment which clarifies an ethical form of life from within the horizon of a life history or a form of life. In each of these three cases, practical reason is assumed to achieve something different which is shown by the different types of uh, discourse in which we uh, move uh, respectively. Let me, in the second and uh, shorter part of my lecture, first briefly uh, elucidate at least some features of these different types of uh, discourse and thereby the different concepts of practical reason. In a certain way, pragmatic discourses, in which we justify technical and strategic instructions, have something in common with empirical discourses. They serve to relate empirical knowledge to hypothetical purposes and preferences and to evaluate the consequences of, of course, always incompletely informed decisions. So, technical or strategic instructions derive their validity from the empirical knowledge that they rely on. Their validity is independent of whether an adversary in fact decides to adopt the instructions or not. Here, no internal relation obtains between, let me say, reason and will. In ethical discourses, this constellation changes to the extent, or to the effect, that valid advice does, or at least is supposed, to provide a rational motive for a switch in attitude and disposition. In the processes of reaching self-understanding, the roles of participants in argumentation and the role of social actors somehow overlap. Whoever wants to gain a clear view on his life or her life as a whole, who wishes to justify seeing his value decisions and to ascertain his or her identity, cannot be substituted as a participant in an ethical discourse, as it is, of course, the case in pragmatic discourses. Notwithstanding this partic particularistic feature, we can, I think, still speak of a discourse, for here the argumentational steps must also remain open to their intersubjective supervision and cooperation. The members of the same life world 
are the potential participants who take on the catalytic role of the text critics in processes of reaching self-understanding, and this role then can institutionally, so to say, uh, uh, differentiate it, uh, become differentiated out into the professional role of a therapist. Now, reaching an understanding of self leads to evaluative statements on what is good for a particular person. Such evaluations rest on the reconstruction of a life history, whereas now, reconstruction means not only the descriptive grasping of formative processes, by then of which I have become the person I find myself to be, it simultaneously means a critical sifting and reorganization of the elements in such a way that my own past appears in the light of current alternatives as the consistent developmental pattern of the very person whom I wish to be and to remain and as whom I wish to be accepted also in the future. That existentialist thinker of thought that uh, Heidegger called uh, uh, Gewaltner uh, a dwarf projected project illuminates the um, uh, Janus face of those strong evaluations for which justification is gained via a critical appropriation of one's own life history. Here, genesis and validity can no longer be separated from one another as in the case of technical and strategic instructions. In the very uh, act of recognizing what is good for me, I simultaneously make the advice my own. By convincing myself of a clinical advice, I already decide to reorient my life as advice, whether I succeed or not. Of course, my identity only gives way, so to say, to the reflexive pressure of a changed understanding of self. In fact, is defenseless even when confronted with such an hitting advice if this understanding obeys the same standards of authenticity as does the ethical discourse itself. Such a discourse assumes a pre-existent striving for an authentic life on the part of the adversary, and in so far, the whole enterprise of ethical discourse remains dependent on the prior decision to lead a conscious life. Now, Aristotle said ethics is only something for people who has been correctly socialized. This is another way to put the same point. And Kierkegaard, of course, is the one single example who, in fact, analyzed this uh, 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 process of becoming prepared to take such a radical uh, uh, self-choice, as he called it. So, in ethical discourse, reason and will mutually determine one another while they remain both embedded in the context thematized in such discourse as a topic. In such processes of reaching self-understanding, the participants must not jump out of the particular life history or form of life in which they actually find themselves. By contrast, now, moral practical discourses demand just that. They demand a break with everything that is taken as a matter of course in a customary, concrete, ethical life. They require that I take a distance from those contexts of life with which my own identity is bound up. Only under the presuppositions of a universal discourse in which all those possibly affected could take part and where each could adopt an argumentational stance to the validity claims 
of fundamental norms and actions. Only here is a complete reversal of roles and uh, perspectives possible. And this is, of course, the very idea of a universal discourse uh, laid out by George Herbert Mead. This vantage point of impartiality that allows us to transcend the subjectivity in here, in each person's own perspective, but without, and that is important, but without losing its link to the performative attitude of the participants. The objectivity of an ideal observer would block any access to the intuitive knowledge of the life world. Moral argumentation requires instead the idealizing expansion, expansion of our communication community from within. Norms will meet with agreement before this form only if they express a common interest of all those affected. And to this extent, discursively grounded norms bring to bear at once both a recognition of what lies in the equal interest of everyone as well as a general will that has, at least presumably, without repressing any single will, absorbed within itself the wills of all. In this sense, the will that is determined by moral reasons does not remain external to practical reason. The autonomous will, so to say, is absorbed by this type of uh, reason. It is very hot. I uh, think you allow me to uh, finish with the official part of uh, this uh, uh, event. Now, as a consequence, Kant believed that practical reason first truly becomes, uh, uh, becomes, so to say, uh, in its own, uh, as this norm-testing competence that means Kant really uh, identifies practical reason with this uh, very narrowly defined uh, concept of morality. Now, in interpreting the categorical imperative, we have to be careful in order to avoid the one-sidedness of Kant's theory, a theory that concentrates solely on questions of moral justification. I have two reservations. First, as soon as moral justification relies on a principle of universalization that compels the participants to submit problematic norms independent of particular situations, independent of given motives or existing institutions, to the test of what all would will, the question arises whether norms which would be justified in such a manner, can be applied at all, can be applied to any situation in any case. Such norms owe their abstract generality to the fact that they only stand the test of universalization in a decontextualized form. In such an abstract form, valid norms can, however, only be applied without further ado to standard situations which are already characterized by those conditions that are specified in advance in the if component of the rule. However, every justification of norms has to operate under the normal limitations of a finite mind. In the process of justification, we cannot, a fortiori, consider all those traits that once made 
characterize the constellations of unforeseen particular cases. It is for this reason that the application of laws requires an additional argumentation of its own, which uh, Kant never took into consideration. The impartiality of the judgment cannot, ga cannot again be secured in this process of application by the principle of universalization. When confronted by questions of context-sensitive application, practical reason must rather be brought to bear via another principle, I call it the principle of appropriateness. In the case of application, it must be shown, namely, which of the norms already presumed to be valid are most suited to a given problem now in the light of all the relevant features of a situa situation which is as exhaustively described as possible. The procedure of justification remains incomplete until it is complemented by an as rational procedure of application. Now this was the first renovation. The second one is this. Discourses of application remain, as do those of justification, a purely cognitive affair and thus offer no compensation for first having uncoupled moral judgments from actors, motives, and institutional context. Moral judgments are valid irrespective of whether the adversary actually does what is held to be right. Certainly, the autonomy of the adversary's will must be, let me say, measured in terms of whether he or she is able to act according to his or her moral judgments. But moral insights, as we well know, do not by themselves bring about moral actions. The validity claim associated with normative sentences is certainly of a binding nature. This is part of the semantic content. In Kant's terminology, an obligation makes you feel how your will is affected by a normative claim to validity. And the bad conscience, by the way, that plagues us when we have acted against our better insights, shows that the reasons on which such a validity claim is based are not without any impact. Feelings of guilt, are a, a palpable indicator of uh, violations of obligations, yet, in such a case, they only express that we know that we have no good reasons for acting otherwise. So, good feelings indicate some sort of a split in will. Let me, in the end, uh, shift uh, the level of analysis and turn from individual to collective will formation. That will be the topic of my uh, seminar tomorrow. Empirical will split off from autonomous will, in a Kantian sense, plays a noteworthy role in the dynamics of our moral learning processes, if there is such a thing. Such a split is a symptom for a weakness of will only if the moral demands which it violates are at the same time legitimate and can be imputed to a person under given conditions. More often, the protest of a diverging empirical will is not just 
a sign of weakness that can be attributed to an individual actor. More often, it discloses the voice of someone excluded by rigid moral principles and selectively applied moral principles. I mean the voice of injured integrity and of human dignity, the voice of the denied difference. How does this work? Now, in moral discourse, validity and genesis are again disconnected as it is necessary in a cognitive enterprise. Since the principles of a post-traditional post morality lay claim to a status which is somehow analogous to two premises. So, universal claims to validity may sometimes provide a facade, and behind this facade um, a, a powerful but unjustifiable interest that is merely forced through can also more easily conceal and entrench itself. Therefore, social movements and political battles have repeatedly been and will continue to be necessary in order to break the chains of a false, merely pretended universality of a biased appeal to principles which are in fact only selectively read and applied in an insensitive fashion. Thus, we can learn from the painful experiences and sometimes from the irreparable sufferings of those who have been humiliated and insulted, wounded and slain, we can learn from that that no one may be excluded in the name of any moral universalism, be they underprivileged classes, an exploited nation, a marginalized minority or suppressed, suppressed women. Whoever excludes in the name of universalism another party who has a right to remain a stranger to the others betrays the very idea he or she espouses. Correctly understood and carefully handled, the universalism of equal respect for everybody and of solidarity with all does not contradict, but I think we have even empirical evidence for that, even promotes radical pluralism, the growth and variety of different forms of life and individualized life projects. Now, uh, this uh, thought, it's uh, only a hint, of course, already goes beyond the bounds of our, uh, of tonight's uh, uh, consideration of individual will formation. Thus far, our examination of the pragmatic, ethical, and moral employment of practical reason has been informed by the traditional question of what ought I to do? If the direction of the question is shifted from the first person singular to the first person plural, then it is more than just the forward of reasoning uh, which uh, changes, I think. What we have to face is not a shift in perspective, let's say from the interiority of monological thought to the publicity of a discourse, but rather a change in the way the problem is put. The role changes in which we encounter other persons. I think that, in fact, new problems arise once that other person is a real person who confronts me with his or her own stubborn 
non-substitutive, non-substitutive will. It is above all the reality of a will foreign to me that belongs to the conditions of a collective will formation. The fact of the plurality of actors, Hannah Arendt, and the condition of double contingency in social interaction poses the problem uh, that uh, uh, Parsons, in his uh, technical language, has uh, called uh, the problems of pattern maintenance and collective goal attainment. You know that contractarian theories in modern natural law have reacted to these very problems. They miss, however, I think, the intersubjective nature of a collective will formation that must not be thought of as an individual will formation projected on a larger scale. Cognitive operations then are no longer accomplished in mental. They shift onto the level of the procedures and communicative presuppositions of discourses and negotiations that are actually uh, carried out. So uh, I will, uh, in a similar but much more complicated way, I say that in a more uh, internal way, uh, take up uh, the same questions that has been have been dealt with by uh, contractarian uh, theories uh, tomorrow. Thank you. Professor Abamas has kindly agreed to take questions from the floor. Are there any questions? Uh, well, while people are getting out, I have a question. Um, uh, I, I'm not really sure that Habermas divides the territory quite the way that I want to divide it. And just to clarify my own understanding of what he said, let me say a little bit about how it seems to me the distinction between what he calls strong evaluations and other sorts works and what it has to do with self-definitions. It seems to me there's clearly a distinction between the kind of decision you make when you're deciding whether or not to choose a Chevrolet or cheat on your income tax and the kind of decision uh, that you make when you're deciding whether or not to commit suicide. And in the first case, uh, you can appeal to a, a, a prior preference uh, schedule and a, on a, a prior existing uh, self-conception. And uh, Kant, both Kant and the utilitarians really seem to me to be more addressed to that kind of a distinction. But when you're deciding on the other sort of question that involves basic self-definitions, who am I, what sort of person am I, you can't appeal to a pre-existing preference scale because that's what you're trying to invent. And there isn't any criteria to which you can appeal to. And I think in a way you could really argue against Kant you can't even appeal to the categorical imperative because what you're trying to decide is, am I the sort of person who lives by the categorical imperative or maybe I don't give a damn about the categorical imperative. Now, that distinction seems to me to cut across the, the moral, non-moral distinction. And I'm not sure that that's the way I would divide up the territory and I wasn't really clear if that was how you were dividing it up. And one thing that puzzled me was the remarks that you made at the end about appropriateness. Because, of course, where the Kantian category, I mean, that was addressed, I take it, to Kant. And the point about the Kantian categories is they only are intelligible from inside. Uh, that is, I have to ask myself, what's the intentional content of the motivation of this decision? And can I universalize that? And then the appeal to the public characterization would seem to be irrelevant. But anyway, what's your reaction? Yeah, I, mean, uh, I think that uh, the, the ethical, as you put it, overlap uh, moral and non-moral, but uh, uh, my uh, terminological proposition was to define uh, morality 
on Kantian lines is narrow, uh, or so narrow, that uh, uh, there is no uh, moral uh, element uh, included in uh, uh, ethical reasoning, as you said. Um, but it is still a normative kind of reasoning. So I don't, I don't see uh, a really interesting uh, difference in, uh, uh, I mean, making the conceptual cuts between the two of us. Now, to the more important, uh, in my view, more important question of justification and application, uh, maybe uh, this is a very brief way to introduce uh, complicated, uh, but anyhow, well-known questions. Um, I think <coughs> that to justify an action in the light of a given norm or to justify a norm in the light of a given principle or to justify given principles, just procedurally, um, can operate along, con can operate along uh, at least the intuition of universalization that is uh, expressed in the categorical imperative. I would give this universalization procedure, however, uh, a, uh, an intersubjectivist leading according to uh, pragmatists like uh, George Trevor Mead, namely what uh, is really particular in uh, this American tradition is uh, the solution of one problem. Let me just extend, and I mean, I know that you, uh, I mean, I mean, I, you are so, so, uh, let me say, um, easy in dropping, I mean, the, the best and most important tradition of this country. That I, let me just, let me just, <laughs> let me just, uh, 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 makes a point. Yeah? I mean, traditionally, in a Kantian way uh, of uh, argument, one uh, says, oh, uh, look at Socrates, look at Luther uh, before the Reichstag in Augsburg, who said, here I am standing, I cannot but to uh, act in this and not in another way. And so there was an appeal to, uh, if, if one wants to explain autonomy, to uh, the individual mind as against the whole world. Now, what is left out in terms of intuitions that should be safe is that then morality in fact becomes something that is most seriously and in the last instance solved in the innermost core of the lonely soul. But this contradicts totally uh, to the uh, reverse side of justice, which is namely covered by morality too, namely to the intuition that to act morally mean to act as well just as in a solidary way only. That this solidarity is not just to my family, not just to my city, but to mankind. Now, uh, Mead uh, took these examples and said, no, I mean, in order to cover uh, this uh, solidaric feature of moral um, uh, uh, universalism, we should rather think of an appeal to a community which transcends in some and the most severe cases that community in which I, in fact, uh, have been raised and grown up and still am a depending, dependent social actor. So, what he invents is the, uh, not so to say the appeal to, to a categorical an imperative, to a uh, the law of morals or whatever, who, uh, which then can be applied by a single mind. No, 
what he is appealing to or what he is proposing is that we should think of an appeal to uh, a community that ideally encloses all those which would be affected by uh, uh, an action or uh, an affording norm, uh, if only it would be established as a universal law. Now, if you think about justification in that way, then application should be really distinguished, I think, in a different way than, than we are usually uh, we are used to. Namely, then we have uh, uh, somehow uh, to see that the very uh, notion of impartiality, which is at the core of the notion of settling moral conflicts, is only halfway um, uh, covered yeah, by the principle of universalization, whether in a Kantian or median fashion. And that there must be, again, a certain principle, and I take these principles to be uh, exclusively of a procedural nature, please, I mean, there's nothing substantive with it. Uh, uh, there is then a principle of uh, appropriateness which demands to uh, uh, select independently justified norms among them in the light often as exhaustively described uh, situation as uh, possible, and then uh, the, the, the picture somehow is different. I was too long. Um, okay, other questions uh, to Professor Habermas? Yes, this person here. I'd like to know if you have a developmental model of morals, then doesn't it seem that this, doesn't it seem that the, this developmental model is really a meta morality that the first principle of morality would have to be not to obstruct one's own development on the scale of morality with that of another? Now, uh, apart from the developmental side, I come back to that. Um, uh, I would say that uh, what philosophers are usually talking about and should only talk about, as philosophers I mean, uh, is something very trivial and not very substantive, namely uh, the uh, explanation what it means to settle a certain type of conflict impartial, impartially. That means they explain, to put it in the traditional phrase, uh, the moral point of view. But with this, uh, they just remind everybody who has been raised in the family and has somehow learned uh, to get uh, into uh, the very reciprocities and mutualities of recognition which are linked with the very type of communicative action through which socialization processes can proceed only anyhow. I mean, uh, uh, what, what they do is to remind uh, anybody of us uh, of the very formal point of view which allows to uh, discuss in a reasonable way moral conflicts. With this, there is no single moral question of any substance uh, Solved. And this is important because uh, since 2000 years, philosophers suppose that they are the ones who can set up a morality in terms of, I mean, substantive points of views and norms. Maybe they can do that, but then please, they should be aware that they change their role and uh, show up as a participant among participants. Because only in moral discourses proper, and this is not a moral discourse which I have been leading uh, 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 tonight, only in proper moral discourses we can jointly, I mean, take 
those decisions, the consequences of which we have to carry too. So it is a very minor business if you want from a participant's point of view that is or can be solved by philosophers. Now the developmental thing, um, whether now this is something meta-ethical or meta-theoretical you said, um, and whether uh, if you uh, look at it from a developmental perspective, um, yeah, um, you um, are engaged in, uh, like Kohlberg, in uh, uh, laying out uh, only a uh, empirical theory into which certain normative premises uh, have been built in. I mean, if that was the question, then I would just say, yes, maybe I misunderstood you. Uh, there's a question over here, Professor Nader. I'm not a philosopher, I'm an anthropologist, and I'm attracted to the word practical in your title. Could you conceive of using, could you tell us how you might use the concept of practical reason to remedy the fact that there has never been a woman who was given the house of lecture in philosophy? <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad to leave the answer to uh, those in charge. Uh, I, I, I'm happy to suggest that Professor Nader be on the selection committee. <laughs> other, uh, other questions? No. Uh, I, I, I think that on the ethical and the pragmatic side, uh, I can see how uh, people make judgments in their times. Uh, but in about 40 years, in the last 40 years, I have been trying to decide whether America is an imperialist enterprise or the shield of the West. So on the moral side, uh, the, the set of moral structures which we all agree on don't seem to quite let me know how to deal with that problem. I, I hope it's appropriate to the problem. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, this is uh, a well-known issue of political debates, and the answer depends on uh, more or less well-informed uh, uh, political attitudes. Uh, of course, saying that, it means that there can be on these issues also some uh, information of, uh, from the side of political and sociological and economic analysis. And uh, if we look into this field, into this field, then you see again, uh, at least uh, more recently, that the field is uh, heavily split. I don't think that it helps you if I just utter my own political opinion on this. I mean, um, I'm, I'm not hesitating to utter political opinions, I mean, but, but then uh, we should do it uh, not with any uh, philosophical authority. Um, uh, uh, just coming back to, uh, I mean, the former question, I don't want to escape the type of question. Um, of course, as uh, an anthropologist and as a sociologist, uh, you and I can easily analyze, I mean, the uh, selection mechanisms of uh, higher education in uh, the United States and in Europe in order to give an explanation of that fact. I mean, this is no normative answer to that, of course. Uh, uh, I'm happy to tell Professor Nader that Elizabeth Anscom was uh, the, the uh, Howison lecturer. Elizabeth is from uh, Cambridge University. Uh, are there other questions at this point? Uh, yes, over here. Uh, 
Yes, we can hear you if we all shut up. You have mentioned that the position of the ideal observer, and I am wondering whether rational discourse is this the sole requirement to get to that position of the ideal observer, or are there other, other requirements and qualifications to get to that position? As you know, there are material interests and contributory interests there. I, my question is whether rational discourse can somehow, uh, or what is, is a way to, uh, to work out the, those conflicts. You might have, you might have answers to, to this question, but I have missed it. Yeah, as far as I understand, I mean, it has two aspects. I didn't refer to the uh, ideal observer as a uh, sufficient model. This is a model of utilitarianism, and I do think that if you take that position, you cut yourself up from all moral intuitions, and that from all necessary knowledge. So uh, the uh, uh, position for the moral point of view I uh, propose is that of a higher order intersubjectivity that means the uh, point of view of participants in a discourse uh, which operates from the presupposition at least that each is willing and capable of taking the perspectives of everybody else. That is, uh, you get a uh, position of impartiality from within that's the Rousseauian model, I mean in this respect, and you don't get pseudo-objectivity from a third person's view, which is just not uh, applicable, applicable to moral questions. But as far as I understand, you are just dissatisfied with uh, the whole uh, model of uh, rational discourse and are asking, of course, uh, I mean, what should it mean in face of, uh, I mean, uh, the reality of listening to debates and uh, of uh, other uh, less uh, uh, enjoyable uh, features of public communication and private as well? Uh, now, uh, did I did I go there? Did I did I get the question? But, uh, but there's another aspect of the question, and that is you appealed earlier to the concept of an ideal community. And I guess the difficulty with that is uh, when you specify the features of the ideal community, you have perfect discourse and the community is perfectly rational uh, and it uh, uh, strives, uh, or on some other models, it strives to maximize some sort of good then it looks like the notion of the ideal community reduces uh, to more traditional notions. That is, it looks like the ideal community doesn't add anything to the tradition and ethics because the features of the community are already contained in these other theories. Now, what's your reaction to that? I, uh, I know only of, uh, as I said, the primitive tradition in which this uh, uh, type of uh, ideal role taking or universal discourse has been applied to uh, 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 the uh, explication, the question of application of the moral point of uh, view. I uh, do think that uh, more is implied in this intersubjectivist notion of morality than in the uh, traditional ones because um, you have uh, both sides in one uh, uh, taking into consideration, namely the aspect of uh, the equal respect for everybody. And this is, a, this is sort of saying a glance on the individual whose autonomy has to be respected. And, on the other hand, you have equally taken into consideration the aspect of uh, solidarity, that means of being a member of uh, some sort of 
communities of structure of which is jointly shared. And um, uh, I uh, think that uh, my somewhat complicated notion of, uh, of, of discourse, I mean of modern discourse, which uh, should be analyzed in terms of pragmatic presuppositions, which are necessary for all those who uh, enter the discourse, that this um, notion of discourse is a, let me call it, reflexive form of uh, communicative action. And uh, that means that in the very communicative structure of such a discourse on the pragmatic level, there is something built in right of these positions, namely built in what we also have built in into uh, communicative action and interaction, that means certain uh, 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 reciprocities in uh, uh, recognition, uh, certain uh, um, uh, possibilities to change uh, perspectives, not only from first to second, second to third, third to first person, but also uh, perspectives from person to person and so on. So, I mean, if I would go into this, then you would see, this was not my topic uh, today, then you would see that um, uh, the intersubjectivist approach does make a difference. But I don't think that this was a question of the lady. I mean, I mean, uh, it wasn't was, uh, was answered to, to you. Um, let me see. I mean, did, I, did, I, did I get it in restating your question? Did I get it? Oh, I, I can't think. There's a question here in the front row. Well, I guess what I heard the woman's question had to do with um, material precondition yeah. for a uh, speech and community. Yeah. And can you address that? You know, the yeah. material and the linguistic yeah. and institutional um, because the question of power is lurking behind that. I don't know if everybody in the back could hear that. But the questioner was asking about the material preconditions of a Professor Halamaz's conception of an ideal speech and community. And would Professor Habermas address himself to what kind of uh, uh, economic basis is necessary to have his ideal? Now, uh, the uh, approach tonight was conventional, that means great normative. And uh, from that perspective, you uh, can get to the point where uh, the uh, maybe really important questions. Uh, of uh, uh, social and economic and material preconditions show up, but you can deal with them from that perspective. Now, there's one way. Let me let me uh, take one route in order to to make you aware of the perspective I have. There is one route to continue this normative kind of reasoning, and uh, yet to uh, uh, see what it implies for the answer of your question. Uh, I had expected that uh, some of you, and many of you, of course, do have these questions, um, would have asked um, how we really, what, what it really means to distinguish with, uh, between these three categories of uh, uh, practical questions, and uh, whether there is not implied a much deeper problem, namely how to recognize which problem is of a moral or an ethical or a uh, pragmatic nature, since it is so easy to turn all practical questions, for instance, uh, into utilitarian ones or rational choice questions, or to turn any moral question, like uh, my friend Chuck Taylor or Sandel or our colleague uh, 
uh, Bernard Williams, who turned any question uh, of a practical and normatively known nature into an ethical one. So, uh, and in practical life, for instance, we have this primary evidence that there are some people who aestheticize everything uh, and uh, understand uh, all practical questions as somehow uh, questions of how to ex express oneself or how to find uh, the right code, uh, the right symbol system, the right uh, uh, sequence of signs and so on and so on. So uh, we, uh, we, we, we see economizers, we see aestheticizers, we see moralizers, and I uh, suppose we have also, this is my invention, ethicalizers. For instance, if you have seen the uh, uh, apostolic letter of the Pope, which I read in the New York Times the other day, then, I mean, it is an ambiguous statement, at least in this, uh, selective uh, presentation there, but there seems to lurk in the background um, uh, a, uh, an attempt to deal with straightforward moral questions in ethical terms, namely in terms of uh, how we interpret that form of life in which the relation between men and women is, so to say, defined, or patterned, or whatever. Uh, while, I mean, if this really comes to the fore, and if then one image of feminism, of femininity, if that is a word, like that, um, rules out, I mean, questions of equal rights, for instance, at the working place in the on the labor market and so on, then we would have, I mean, I'm careful here, we would have a instance, an instance uh, for, yeah, turning moral questions into ethical one uh, without sufficient justification. So, one could have asked that question, and I, I'm, I'm uh, at least worried by it, and uh, I uh, am not prepared to uh, recur to subjective faculties like judgment. Now, not in the Aristotelian sense. I mean, in fact, it is some sort of judgment that we somehow use if, I mean, uh, somebody who uh, makes uh, on the stage a happening uh, uses somebody from the audience in such a way that uh, this time of happening goes nearly to the border of a rape, let's say. Then, of course, you can easily imagine the type of uh, discourse. Half of them say, look, this is really art, and the other half uh, says, look, I mean, this is morally uh, in, in dignity, or whatever, unmorally, yeah. Um, uh, 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 and then, what is it? What is it? What makes us aware when the moral kind of flesh applies, or the ethical one, or the pragmatic one? Now, I mean, in fact, it is something which we cannot really explain. It's something like judgment. So, from this, I am now I come back after this detour to your question. So, it is from this, I mean, purely normative uh, perspective, um, that I think that there are somehow um, selective, well-founded selective mechanisms which do uh, lay constraints, moral constraints on ethical decisions and moral and ethical constraints on pragmatic uh, decisions, um, but how to justify it when we only have the competition of several types of discourse that we know. There is no meta-discourse, I mean. Now, my intuition 
to answer that question from this non-empirical perspective is to say, look, only to the extent that we would have a type of institutional framework which is able to, and which is capable to implement practical reason in all its dimensions um, into collective processes of collective will formation on all levels. Only if we would have that type of institutionalization, it is not just a just society, no. It is a society which would institutionally, so to say, provide a probability for justiceness, for goodness and for efficiency at the same time, I mean. Only then we would have a uh, selective mechanism which uh, is not, so to say, imputed to the subjective faculties of individual uh, uh, human uh, beings. In saying that, I only want to a point of course uh, to uh, the totally different uh, matters of uh, how we can analyze the uh, present situation in societies like ours, analyze from the viewpoint of counteracting tendencies, and now evaluating these tendencies in terms of whether they rather work uh, in favor in a given complete situation of a even only step by step further implementation of that uh, practical reason which has to take an institutional shape within collective well formation or not. And then as actors, as political actors, we can make up our minds what to do about it in order to take our role to uh, act in support for those uh, tendencies. So uh, I only say that in order to, to, to uh, I mean, to, to make clear that I am the last who uh, would stop uh, normative reasoning just at that point. But, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, then you have uh, to go into, into, of course, different types of analysis, of political, economic analysis. I think I have time for one more question. Yes? Um, how do you find the ideas about morality in ideal discourse communities to real discourse communities, that is, real discourse communities where there is no single standard or norm of rationality. For example, there are communities in this country of religious fundamentalists, people who believe in the liberal tolerance, uh, people who believe in mystical practices, and so on, all in a single community. How can one make sense of your ideas in the case of communities like that? Now, uh, there is an answer to that from uh, two perspectives. One is the perspective of, uh, 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 let me say, a uh, second person performative uh, attitude, namely of a participant in argumentation. From this and only from this perspective, I maintain that you cannot, anyone, cannot enter argumentation that means some business which is designed for convincing each other. You cannot enter argumentation proper without presupposing that there is a sufficient uh, um, 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 uh, annehrung, what is it? Uh, annehrung, uh, 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 approximation. Approximation uh, to uh, the three suppositions 
that uh, in fact uh, this ongoing discussion is to a sufficient extent free from uh, uh, contingent force from within and from without so that there is space for uh, that particular force of the better argument. This is only, please, only what one can analyze as a necessary intuitive knowledge that we bring to the pragmatic settings of argumentations, and it says nothing about uh, the empirical processes, not nothing, but not so much from an observer's point of view, which is informed by this second person knowledge, uh, we can then empirically analyze and also critically describe uh, what is going on as a deviant and distorted pattern of communication. Now, fundamentalist uh, groups, uh, as an example, uh, they discuss with each other uh, under uh, certain substantive premises which they uh, exclude from being, by their very nature, uh, from being treated hypothetically. And uh, we know that uh, these types of discourses are I mean, relevant for religious communities, for uh, types of metaphysical, pre-modern metaphysical uh, reasoning. Uh, I mean, uh, we are not in a position to just rule that out. But uh, from a sociological point of view, I cannot see how uh, it can survive because uh, I mean, the uh, uh, basic structures of modern societies work under premises, for instance, in the legal system, under premises which are incompatible with that attitude. That is not saying that there is not also a type of experience that is, by God, worse of being saved. But not in these terms, I think, can they be safe uh, uh, within modern societies so that uh, in our types of societies these communities form enclaves. But uh, there are also counterexamples, uh, Khomeini and so on. And uh, again, I mean, what should I now apply my uh, uh, interpretation uh, to it, I mean, there are certain explanations, more or less plausible, why that uh, can uh, happen. But I don't think that it really can stand once the culture is broken up, once there is no longer a totality which is immune from uh, pressures from without, and uh, this is not the modern condition. Really. Uh, I want to remind you that the uh, discussion can continue tomorrow when Professor Habermas will lecture in the Men's Faculty Club Library at 2 p.m. And I want to thank Professor Habermas for his excellent presentation.